this talk in particular, I'm looking forward to because for the longest time, and even I did this, when we started doing red teaming, it was all about us winning. And that in retrospect, wasn't cool, right? That, that wasn't nice. We should not have been like that, right? So Tony's gonna uh, do a talk here on red versus blue and getting more blue team value, right? Because we always say the whole goal of the red team is to bring some blue team value. Uh, so Tony, thank you uh, for coming and doing this talk. Uh, senior engineer, uh, doing awesome, awesome stuff for the last uh, few years. Um, go ahead and take it away. The floor is yours and thank you again. Well, thank you, George, and thank you, everyone. My name is Tony Drake, and this is Red versus Blue, getting blue team value from red team testing. So first, a quick disclaimer. All opinions expressed herein are strictly my own. Do not attribute them to any person, place, thing, any employer, past, present, future, real, imaginary, fictional, ideal. You get the idea. Also, I am a Southern storyteller. I grew up in the South. We can argue about whether Florida is in the South another day, but I will tell stories and I will talk in the first person. I, me, we, our, etc. Please do not assume that I am referring to any particular employer or person when I do. So a lexicon, we've had a lot of talks today and a lot of people have used a lot of terms. I want to be clear about the way that I will be using terms in this talk. The first one is blue team. This is the group of people who respond to incidents. And the SOC is where the blue team lives. Well, actually, it's where we work. But those of us who have been on blue team a long time, it only kind of feels like we live there. The red team is an internal team of people who perform structured exercises to mimic cyber attacks to the organization. Pen testers is a group of externally contracted people who perform red team testing against your organization. I will use red team and pen testers somewhat interchangeably throughout this talk. So who am I? Well, believe it or not, I have been doing this for about 25 years. I look at that slide every time and it's like, wow. Um, I have been in industries ranging from consumer products to pharmaceuticals to financial services. I have experience in both red team and blue team aspects of security. I hold SANS certifications in pen testing, forensics, and intelligence. So a quick outline of where we're going to go today. I'm going to talk about the problem and the goal, the four syndromes that haunt the SOC, how we combat those four syndromes, and the levels of attacker sophistication, and there will be time for Q&A. So the problem with pen tests as a red team exercise has to do with the cost. They are expensive and resource intensive, and it's not just cash. It is time from management, from the legal and contracts team, from the people who have to set up any access or give them equipment or provide them with data. So because of this, when we pay all this money and spend all this time and effort, we tend to focus on attacker goals. This generates a lack of value for the blue team from the test. This is typically because mutually exclusive goals seldom lead to optimal outcomes. The blue team goal is to seek and destroy. I have one goal. I want to find evil. I want to eradicate it and I want to nuke it from orbit. The red team has one goal. They want to get in and they want to burrow ever deeper, persisting and maintaining and doing more and more stuff. These goals are mutually exclusive. So why don't we try and change the mentality here? This pen tests and red team exercises are more than just a checkbox and more than just a red team item. We're going to try and use those red team exercises for blue team training. We're going to allow tests to benefit both the red and the blue team. And we're going to use catch and release methods to better accomplish a wide variety of goals with the same test. So the sick sock syndromes, try saying that one 10 times fast without spitting, it's not easy. So there are four main syndromes that haunt the sock. These are cry wolf syndrome, burnout syndrome, 
Miser syndrome, and Tarzan syndrome. The cry wolf syndrome occurs because blue teams during pen tests are typically very front loaded on their effort. An alarm comes in, a detection is, is triggered, and there are a lot of time and resources used to verify and package before you go to the management verification step and say, look what I found. And when you package this up, you walk with your head high to management and say, look what I found. And they said, congratulations, it's a test, let them go. This means we're not following our blue team processes. We're not going to actually cut off access. We're not going to reformat systems. We're not going to do any of the things that we typically would do when we find evil. Because of this, when you do a lot of testing, and I have been in environments where we do an awful lot of testing, you get this mentality on the blue team of everything is just a test. All we ever have is tests, so why bother? And this is in part due to miser syndrome. Miser syndrome occurs because, as I said earlier, these tests are expensive, and management wants the biggest bang for their buck. They want to increase the red team value because that's what they're paying for. When they do this, they decrease the blue team value because they are not focused on what the blue team needs to be effective. This results in blue team burnout. The blue team burnout occurs because you do this time and time again. You feel like you're always fighting with one hand tied behind your back and you just kind of wonder, why should I even bother? we need to strike a better balance between red team and blue team. All of these syndromes together culminate in the Tarzan syndrome. Because the red team is allowed to continue, there is resentment in the sock on the part of the blue team that, you know, why are we here if we're just letting them run rampant? On the other hand, you feel awful when you miss an alert or when something happens and you think it's one thing and it turns out in the report to have been something else. Professional red teams, Ben testers, they want to gain future business. So they tend to emphasize their accomplishments and focus on what they were able to do and how bad it is for the organization. When the blue team gets this report, they feel like they haven't been given credit. Part of this occurs because the red team and the pen testers don't really know what the blue team is doing because we're letting them go. The blue team stops, make the red team wins invalid in the mind of the blue team. We could have stopped them at two, four, six, and eight. And the red team counters, well, yes, but if you didn't stop us at two, four, six, and eight, we would have continued and look what three, five, seven, and nine was, especially nine. Nine's a real doozy. That's awful. So how do we fix this? How can we go about trying to find a better way? finding a better mix between red team and blue team value. There are four main areas that I see repeatedly that need to be addressed in order to do this. The first is to improve communication from management on pen test purpose, scope, and ramifications. We need to capture more data during the test. As a blue team, we thrive on data and we starve when there isn't enough of it. We need to vary our testing methodologies to keep it interesting. And for the advanced class, we're going to make it more of a training exercise, gamification for the win. So improving communication on pen testing purpose, scope, and ramifications. There are a few things that happen more commonly than they should. The first is that the blue team ends up, ends up shut out from the readout calls and the reports. The management hired the pen testers, management calls the pen testers, they do a readout call, they get a report, they file it, they walk out into the sock and say, how could this have happened? Even worse is a lack of management communication from the beginning. As a senior analyst or senior engineer, there is nothing worse than frantically running into a conference room with a junior analyst or a junior engineer who is afraid they are gonna get fired because they were the one who missed the critical alert. 
This then spawns a rat race of getting their manager, explaining the problem, getting their manager to call them in and explain there's no problem when it all could have been, been avoided if the manager had just said, this is a security exercise. This is not a performance review. No one's going to get fired over this. For the advanced class, we're going to have the blue team help plan the exercises. The dirty secret of blue team is that we know where all the bodies are buried. We know what works and what doesn't. If you let us help plan exercises, we can highlight where we are effective and we can spotlight where we need help and where things need to be fixed. Capturing more data during the test. I can't count the number of times when we've had a test in January and we've gotten a report in March and the data that we needed from the SIM rolled off in February. If you don't have data, you can't do a post-test deep dive. This increases your value for blue team training. How do you capture more data during the test? Well, there's a few things you can do, including insiders, you know, maybe the senior analyst or the senior engineer of the SOC happens to be on vacation that week when in truth what they're doing is interfacing with the pen test team and the red team and gathering the data and saving it. You can dedicate hunt teams to the test where they actually go in. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, you can use your internal tools. You can capture things like SIM data. You can capture all of your uh, you know, your IR tool data so that it doesn't roll off. You can use sniffer laptops. You can plug into a span port, a security onion laptop and capture all the data. If you have packet capture, use that capability and capture all the data coming from the pen test laptop. If you have forensic capture capabilities, capture images making it more of a training exercise. Uh, colluding insiders, I started a bit earlier. Uh, you have people who actually actively work with the testers to learn what they are doing when they are doing it and capture that data. Hunt teams, you can dedicate certain people. If you have a large sock, maybe a senior and a junior. If you have a small sock, maybe it's just one junior to go in and actually monitor and track the pen testers as they are an attacker. If you have the capabilities to do full forensic capture, do it because then you can do full forensic analysis and you can see what it looks like when C2 is running on a machine and other things you don't get the opportunity to do very often. When you do this well, you get a second blue team timeline to counter your red team timeline and it becomes a, they did this, we saw that, they did that, we saw this. It gives a much more holistic picture. So testing methodologies to soothe the sick sock. We heard some people talk about this a little bit earlier, but if you see the same thing over and over again, not only does it get boring, but it doesn't expose you to the new technologies and the new techniques that you need to understand as a blue teamer to be an effective tester. If you execute each test with different methodologies, different goals, different people, what you get is different results. And you test different skills, you expose different networks, and you get to see a much better picture of what threats look like. Some of the ways that you can do this are to vary the scale of information given to the red team. Sometimes you give the red team nothing and they have to do their recon. Sometimes you give them the information as though they're a fully informed insider. And so they already know exactly what they're gonna do and how they're gonna do it. Vary the objective, give them specific things that they should or should not do so that they go different places and expose different tools and different techniques. You can vary the amount of time you give to the red team. Sometimes you give them a week, sometimes you give them a month. I know and talk to a lot of red teamers and a lot of pen testers on a regular basis. I have never heard any of them say, wow, I had too much time for that exercise. I hear a lot of them say, if we only had more time, we could have. Other advanced testing methodologies. So having a pen test or a red team exercise is great, 
But from a blue team perspective, that's kind of par for the course. So there are things that you can do to alter the course of a test. Seeding the field of battle first. This involves using your software distribution mechanism to basically plant the malware. And when I talk about malware, I mean red team tooling like Cobalt Strike or Metasploit or you know, different tools from different vendors or different GitHub repositories, not true malware. But the malware all of a sudden at 12 noon on a Friday starts beaconing out from 100 different systems with no visible entry point. This makes the blue team work hard and look at different things. Picking up the story in the middle, this is another trick. You have a colluding insider, this time in the form of an employee or manager who inserts a USB stick or runs something or connects to a website. Live gaming, red versus blue in real time. Put the red and the blue teams or the pen testers in the sock across the table from each other and have them go tit for tat. Have the red team do something, the blue team say, I saw it or I didn't, et cetera. Part four, levels of attacker sophistication. One of the problems with these exercises is there's a, not often a good way to measure what you're doing against what is happening in the real world. Attackers can vary in skill and experience. You have to classify them in order to know how mature your sock is. Since five point scales are the most common, I grew up in Florida, we have hurricanes, out west you have tornadoes, I'm using a five point scale. So level one, these attackers are very unsophisticated. They call them script kitties. I often call them sand spurs because you just can't get rid of them. They're everywhere. They're going to be open source scanning, off the shelf tools, internet scans, no access, no knowledge inside the company. If they find something, it's low hanging fruit. Level two, these are script kitties who get lucky. Maybe they get inside a system. Maybe a phishing email gets clicked. They have commodity malware and tools. They're noisy. They're going to trip your basic detections. They're relatively easy to find and eradicate. Level three, this is your low level competent attacker. They enter the environment and they move around using existing tools. They're going to live off the land using OS tools like PowerShell and WMI. They're going to use lull bins. They're going to custom do certain types of things so that you don't know what they actually did. They're going to obfuscate their PowerShell. They're going to trip some alarms, but probably not too many. They're harder to spot, harder to catch, but pretty easy to get rid of once you find them. Level four, these attackers got inside, they looked around and you kicked them out. And now they're back and they're not going to make the same mistakes twice. These are hard to find and hard to catch because they know internal controls, they have customized approaches per asset and environment. Their phishing is more targeted, their malware more bespoke. Level five, we only want to see this in a test. We never want to see this in real life. These are actively hostile operators. This is the ransomware operator that took down Colonial Pipeline or the Irish Health System or any number of other events we have seen or heard about in the news in, the, in recent times. These attackers are the best. They know your environment probably better than you do. They profile the employees. They try to collect data on them. They know who they're going to target. They are bespoke in their approach to each employee, each asset. They compromise your internal communication servers so they'll read emails and they'll read VOIP uh, to listen to phone calls and your voicemail messages. And they actively create false flags inside the environment. These false flags are things like very loud, very basic malware, again, malware being tools, that you find and you get rid of and you think you're done, while in truth, they're somewhere else. So in summary, how are we going to build a better SOC analyst through red team and pen testing? We are going to improve communication about testing goals and objectives. Management is going to be clear that this is not a job interview. This is not a performance review. This is a security exercise. They are going to make sure that the blue team understands why they're testing and what they're trying to do. 
they're going to allow deeper dives into the data during and after the test so that the blue team can improve their skills. They're going to have colluding insiders capturing data during the test so that the data doesn't disappear. They're going to allow for full forensic capture. They're going to do the types of things that we need to do so a pen test becomes a exercise that gets given to the new analysts to help train them. You're going to vary the levels of testing to keep things interesting. And you're going to provide live fire training in non-critical scenarios. You're going to put the testers on one side of the table and the blue team on the other and have them go one for one so that the blue team understands what things mean and what happens when you do this testing. You're going to look at cyber range or castle versus castle testing, maybe in a professional environment, maybe in your own environment in a conference room, where you can actively engage and basically battle it out like a video game. So that's all for my slides. This is my email address if you'd like to get in touch with me. And I will now turn it over to Q&A. Thank you so much, Tony. So um, there is a question here uh, from Natalia that early on, you're talking about these various fears and uh, we actually got some good feedback on the Slack on this as well. And the question is, how would you recommend approaching this particular fear of failing a particular test from the employee's perspective? And I feel you answered some of this, but maybe you could touch on it a little bit more here. So it's, it's a, a really bad situation when it happens. And, and I talk about it because I've been in the middle of it before. But it's important for management to make clear that nobody loses their job because they missed a pen test, that a pen test is a training exercise. And as an employee, you have to look at it as a training exercise. If you've ever been to a class, if you've ever done anything in school, in school, in college, in a certification course, you don't get the right answer 100% of the time. And you have to understand that. And the expression that I've, that I've heard used is, you have to let yourself off the hook. You, instead of feeling bad about it, instead of worrying about it and revisiting it and thinking, what could I have done better? Or how could I have done that? You learn from it and you move on. And you know, there's, a, there's an old expression about how do you get good judgment? Good judgment comes from experience. How do you get experience? It comes from using poor judgment. And uh, in blue team socks, this happens all the time. You say, this does not look like anything. And then you go back and you realize, yep, that was what I was looking for. Um, you know, and, and I've seen this play out multiple times. Uh, especially with the more dedicated analysts. Yeah, and that's that, that's spot on. I think as you were talking a little bit about this, uh, Ian Mayer, uh, who you all should follow on Twitter, by the way, um, he was talking about that he actually left the company because they fired someone after falling for an exercise. Uh, and of course, that's not the way to go about it, right? Just kind of echoing what you said, and, you know, having some real life experience on this and, and seeing it happen is, is, is definitely very sad, right? And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, working together, even when you're still doing red team exercises, which you should, I, you know, we're here talking about purple teaming, just because you're doing purple teaming now doesn't mean you stop doing those red team exercises. They still have those values. The pen testing has values. The vulnerability scanning and vulnerability management, all that still has value, right? We're just continually evolving and getting better. Um, but there are better ways to do this. And you've really um, talked about those, which, which I loved. Uh, you, know, you, you went through the, the different uh, syndromes, which I thought was, uh, was funny, yet true, yet sad, but all uh, very, very accurate. So again, really appreciate you taking the time um, to give back to a community. Uh, as you've done, uh, definitely a lot of experience and really telling the hard truths uh, here for us. So really appreciate it. Thank you again.